It is up to you to have more good at the end of your life than bad. And if you do, you will go to paradise. I've talked several times about how Islam, and this would really make him mad, I suppose, Islam is really a form of Judaism, kind of a heretical sect of Judaism. We see that also here. For Jews, there are two things. There's the Old Testament, and then there's the Talmud, which is their traditions. Islam has the same thing. The Quran is their Bible, and then they have a whole set of collection of traditions which are more or less reliable. The only Arabic word you might want to remember is hadith. You'll hear that sometimes, but it simply means tradition. Words are not important for your purposes. It may be in the Quran, Muhammad actually said, this is what you should do, or this is what you shouldn't do. Or then in tradition, Muhammad had a group of people around him, sort of like the apostles, who were called his companions. And one of the companions said, well, I heard Muhammad say once, this is what you should do. So I think this should be a rule. In the Roman Catholic Church, they also have things that aren't in the Bible, but that were reported through tradition. Then there can be analogy. Muhammad never talked about anything about helicopters or TV or email. And so by analogy, you'd say, well, if, he, if Muhammad said that about this principle, if he said this about camels, maybe it applies to automobiles. And so on down the line. So you would go by analogy of tradition. And so these are the sayings. And it's just like in the Talmud. There's one place where this occurs in the Bible. Jesus asked the people, they come and challenge Jesus, brother, what do you think about divorce? And then there's two theories. It can be for any reason or only for sexual immorality. Well, those were two different rabbis. And so when the Jews were trying to settle a question, they'd say, well, what did Rabbi Hillel say? What did Rabbi Gamaliel say? And then they would be guided by that tradition. The same thing also here in Islam. What did Muhammad's friend report that Muhammad said about this? And so you have the various traditions that are to guide you. For them, they don't have quite the same authority as the Quran. They could say, well, this tradition, we're not quite so sure. In other words, usually you'll have something like this. Rabbi Hillel told Rabbi Josie, who told Rabbi Gamaliel, that this is what was said by Rabbi Joe. You have like a sighting. And this was the way the Jews did theology too. God gives you forgiveness of sins for free. Grace in Islam doesn't mean for free, it means a bargain. I always go to McDonald's or someplace and they say, free hamburgers. Buy one, get one free. And I say, well, just give me the free one. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got to buy one, and then you get one for free. <clears throat> yeah, I know, I only want one. I just want the free one. <clears throat> I can't convince them that they aren't really giving me free hamburgers. They are willing to give me two half-price hamburgers, but they're not willing to give me a free one. <clears throat> That's the way it is in Islam. God doesn't give you anything really, truly for free. you got to pay a certain amount. Or when my grandchildren were young, they maybe did some work for me, and it was probably worth a quarter. <clears throat> So I gave him a dollar. <laughs> don't, tr don't take this back to Zach. It never happened or anything. But say they broke my picture window. <laughs> and it was going to cost hundreds of dollars to fix it. Well, maybe we th think that since so they should learn something, maybe they should pay something for it. So maybe they had to pay a certain amount from their allowance and something that they were paid. Well, they really weren't paying mm -hmm. what the window was worth. <laughs> but I was giving them a lot more credit. And for some Muslims, they would say, well, Allah will give us a little extra credit. He'll give us a little more credit than our work is worth, or he may not charge us the full price for it, and they call that grace. We would say grace is an all-or-nothing thing. They would say it's not fair for God to demand that we be perfect. Well, I guess we're not in the position to tell God what a holy God can expect. His standard is holiness. God doesn't grade on a curve. And they say Jesus' death isn't necessary because we can do it on ourselves. When I was down at the, a program at the mosque down here on 13th and Layton, they were having people give testimonies, and there was an African-American lady there, and they asked her, well, why did you become Muslim? And she said, well, it gives you such a, a sense of uh, pride and, you know, 
good, good self-image to know that you can work out your salvation. Hmm. And if it were true, I suppose it would. But tragically, she's living in a delusion. She can't work out her salvation. She probably has turned her life around and is doing a lot of things better than she was before. Romans 1 to 5, if you read Romans 1 to 5 and you understand them, and you read them, you understand the whole Bible, don't you? It shows what sin is, and that we have original sin, we commit actual sin, that everybody is condemned by sin, but that God freely forgives us by grace. You have to show a Muslim that sin isn't just murdering people. You kind of take, show them things like in the Sermon on the Mount. Or when you were a child, did you disobey your parents? Did you fight with your brother and sister? Are you jealous of other people? And you have to show them that this is what sin is and that everyone has sin. And if God doesn't punish sin, he's not a holy God. In a way, there was an, an unfixable problem. If God is holy, he has to punish every sin. And he cannot let anybody into heaven who is a sinner. Because then he wouldn't be a holy God, would he? If he just said, ah, oh, that's not a big deal. I was just kidding when I said you shouldn't sin. If you murder somebody... I'll give you a pardon on it. He wouldn't be holy then. But he's also loving and he wants to forgive us. The only way that is possible is at the cross of Christ, isn't it? The Bible is hopelessly in contradiction. The law contradicts the gospel except where they meet in Christ. Because on the cross on Good Friday, you have the greatest preaching of the law. Every sin must be paid for. This is how serious sin is. And also you have the greatest preaching of the gospel. Yes, every sin has to be paid for, but every sin has been paid for. And that's the great and the important truth. <clears throat> they have Sharia law. Sharia law, you've often heard about it. There's all different kinds of categories like, you know, this is a felony, this is a misdemeanor. Sharia law is law that is imposed by the government on the people. Some Christian countries used to have a little bit kind of like of Sharia law, the Puritans in New England, for example. If you didn't go to church on Sunday, you could be fined. And so the religious enforcement was done by the state. Or in medieval Europe, sometimes the uh, heretics were burned at the stake. And they would say, well, the church didn't really burn them at the stake. They turned them over to the government, and the government did. So Sharia law is religious law that is enforced by the state. Even though we would disagree with Muslim law, if Muslims just wanted to live their law like some Orthodox Jews do, some Orthodox Jews say, I won't take a job where I have to work on Saturday on the Sabbath. Or, but in Jerusalem, they don't allow the buses to run in some cities on the Sabbath. And so law that re, when the religious law is enforced by the state, the Muslim name for that is Sharia. And they could say, well, we could have two court systems or we could have just one. No original sin. Try hard. God will give you some extra credit. It's good to know you're accomplishing your salvation, but the bottom line is you can never be sure if you will be saved. A couple weeks ago, I said even the Imam of Appleton was asked a question at a program at our campus house. Are you confident you will go to paradise? And he said, well, nobody can ever know. He said, I'm a good Muslim and I try hard, but nobody can ever know. Maybe if you're a suicide bomber, maybe you've got really a lot of credit, but you can't know. In that respect, the Jewish, uh, Jewish faith and Muslim faith are Identical, yeah, he says the Jewish faith and Muslim faith, they're not identical in every detail of law, but in principle it's exactly the same. Remember I said a couple weeks ago, there's two religions in the world. One is the religion you're saved by grace through faith because God paid for your sin. The other religion is you're saved by the works of the law you do. Now that religion of the works of the law, there's lots of different brand names. The, the Jewish brand name, there's the Muslim brand name, there's the Hindu brand name. And we could say Mormons, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. And so there's only two ways, isn't there? Are you trying to be saved by your own works or are you accepting God's gift of salvation through faith in Christ? Islam tends to be fatalistic. You don't need to know all these. There was a musical some years ago with an Islamic slant called Kismet. They tend to think, extreme example, and some people who have lived in Saudi Arabia told me this is probably more true than I think it is because I... Not all Muslims are fatalistic, but Saddam Hussein was shooting Scud missiles over into Saudi Arabia. A lot of the people weren't going to the bomb shelters. And they said, well, why aren't you going to the bomb shelters? They said, well, if Allah has my name on one of the Scuds, and Allah has set my time is up, it's up. 
if my time isn't up, it isn't up. Some Muslims and some of the terrorist groups are kind of against this because they think it leads Muslims to think, oh, you know, we can't do anything anyway, and that it doesn't make them think we can change the world. So there's a tendency toward fatalism. Islam, as we've talked about, is submission, surrender to the divine will, and some people think this makes them think, well, you know, what will be will be. God's providence, we'll be hearing about it in the reading from Esther in the service, God's providence doesn't mean that we don't work. He uses our work as part of his providence. <clears throat> we believe God will provide our food. <coughs> Luther said that doesn't mean I sit under the sh shade tree waiting for a roast goose to fly into my mouth. <coughs> our work is part of what God uses in his providence. We still have to do it, and yet we believe in God's guidance and protection. I keep going back to this passage. My heart's Desire and prayer for the Israelites is that they may be saved. We could say for the Ishmaelites, the Muslims. They are zealous, but their zeal isn't based on knowledge. They're seeking their own righteousness, not the righteousness from God. They did not submit. Muslim means I submit. I have submitted. You can't submit to God by putting in your own uh, agenda. <clears throat> Just say I got to some of the sports teams try to do that, don't they? they? They've been cheating at the college in some way, and it comes to light. And they quick suspend a guy for two months or something. And they say, well, see, we've taken care of it, and the NCAA doesn't have to worry about it. Everything's great and good. Maybe the NCAA will buy that. Maybe they won't. Or if I get stopped by a policeman, and I'm going to get a ticket for $200 or something. And before he gives me the ticket, I'll say, I, I must have been doing something a little bit wrong. I will gladly pay you $40. <coughs> I don't think that would, <laughs> would quite do it. And so they're saying, we have submitted to God. To submit to God, you have to accept what he says. It's not that you can submit to him what you wish to give. And that's true even in earthly life. Our main topic for today are what are called the five pillars. They, don't use, they usually pretty much just use the English word here. Some people think that jihad, which we'll be talking about next week, is a sixth pillar. But there were only five pillars, and they were listed in the introduction. The confession or the testimony. There's only one God. Muhammad is the apostle. Ritual prayer. We'll have to talk about that a little bit. How many of you get the Milwaukee Journal Sunday? Anybody? Front page story on this in the Milwaukee Journal today. I quickly uh, read it before I came. So we'll have to talk about that. It's the controversy between the Aryans snowblower company and their Somali workers here in Wisconsin, and it's getting national play all over the nation. What is decided here in Wisconsin is going to be a big, big part of this. Fasting in the month of Ramadan, charity of 2.5%, and the pilgrimage to Mecca. The Quran does not list these and say these are the five pillars. They are listed in the tradition as these are the five pillars. But all of these, the roots of all of these are in the Quran. So the five pillars of Islam. This one, I don't think we have to say too much about it. I don't know if I'm moving it. Sometimes you just move by a certain wire. If it buzzes too much, I can probably talk loud enough. We don't have to. This doesn't require much discussion. You become a Muslim if you say there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his apostle. So it really means the witness, the testimony. We've already talked about the fact Allah is the Arabic word for God. So it really, in Arabic, it would be there is no Allah but Allah. There is no God but God. He's like the God of the Bible, and he's a creator and a judge. And a Muslim will say this some 20 times a day. And it's always part of beginning and end of almost everything. So they use it kind of like we would use the Apostles' Creed, very brief, but as a confession. And they would also use it kind of the same way we use the Lord's Prayer. So it's used up to 20 times a day. The first thing a Muslim baby should hear when he's born is he should hear, they should whisper in the baby's ear. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. Many, many moons ago, I think it keeps coming back on Netflix or different places, paid, there was about slaves from Africa. It was called Roots. And they came from the Muslim part of Africa. And there's a scene in there where a little uh, slave baby is born, and they whisper the Muslim words. They should also whisper the Muslim words into a person's ear when they die. What were the 99 names? That's using Allah's name magically. Orthodox Islam would say 
you shouldn't use Allah's name as a magic charm, as if, you know, if you, the sign of the cross can ward off uh, vampires or something like that. And so that's using his name superstitiously. Or if you use the sign of the cross not to confess faith in Christ's death, but kind of so you won't strike out or something like that. It's using it superstitiously. Prayer five times a day. I'll just summarize it first, and then we'll talk about the incident here in Wisconsin. But does anybody have any comments or questions about the confession? It's pretty straightforward. Okay, as I said, prayer again isn't maybe quite the right word for this. This is not petitionary prayer, like where we ask God for something. This is more like a liturgical recitation. It would be somewhat more like in our service where we sing or recite the Psalms. It's kind of more like that. It's usually reciting parts of the Quran, and it should be at five times a day. <laughs> so it means connection, making a connection with God at dawn. And dawn, of course, is a fixed point. Morning, it can be any time. Afternoon, I mean, you got a pretty big window. Sunset, and then sometime during the night. The problem ones, of course, are dawn and sunset. And this is at the heart of the controversy here in Wisconsin with the Aryans Company. They have begun employing Somali uh, immigrants at their snowball, uh, snowblower plant, I think it is. And they have set up prayer rooms for them, and they've agreed that during their work time, they can take two breaks for prayer. But then they're probably like substitutes for a coffee break or something like that. But they said, though, so the assembly line doesn't crash, we've got to have a set time for these. You know, we, we can't have guys leaving, and you know, the assembly line and crash it goes, and then some other guys leave a little later. And the Muslims admit, and I think this is partly a pretext that they're trying to push a case, they admit that the only ones that could be an issue are the sunrise and sunset. Say so sunrise and sunset move around all the time. So even if you're working till 5 o'clock on a weekday, in the middle of the winter, sunset can come before 5 o'clock, can it? Sure. And so you might want a break 20 minutes before the end of the workday to go and do your prayers. And the Arians Company has said, well, we can't really do that. And so the question is, well, what, how far do employers have to accommodate the religious needs of their customers? Can a Christian who believes you must attend church on Sunday say, I can never accept Sunday work? Or can a Jewish person say, I can never accept work on a holiday? Employers may try to accommodate that. And so what the Arians Company said is, we are very glad to give you two prayer breaks but we have to have them at set times. We can't just have somebody in the middle of the assembly line leaving, and he's got to tighten this screw or something. We can't have him leaving and going off to pray. Well, the, the, the Muslim workers quit in the weather to pressure them to bring in Islamic organizations to pressure them that Aryans will have to cave in. I think they're probably a little bit disappointed because some of the Muslims who are pretty well settled here in the work world have said, well, yeah, we want to keep our faith, but we have to understand employers have needs too. And the interesting thing for me in the paper in Milwaukee, it was quite a long story on the front page of the journal. The one who was the Islamic spokesman, he's kind of the main Islamic spokesman, I would say, in Milwaukee. His name is Uthman Atta. He's a Palestinian. He was the moderator at the debates that I had there. And he said, my dad worked for Briggs and Stratton, and Islam allows... You don't have to pray precisely at sunset. He said, sometimes my dad made those prayers up when he came home. So the, the spokesman for the mosque here, 13th Blayton, he, he encouraged the Muslim workers, we're probably not going to win on this, so don't get us a lot of bad press and stir up a lot of feelings. Make up the prayers when you get home. And uh, sometimes they do that by sheer necessity. When can they never pray at sunrise and sunset? If they're in northern Sweden <laughs> or in Alaska and you have the land of the midnight sun oh, yeah. and it's, it's, it's night for 24 hours or it's day for 24 hours. And there they have said, well, pick a time. Say you're going to pray on Mecca time or you're going to pray on Seattle time or something like that. And so it, it isn't as rigid as they were trying to make it that it must be precisely at sunset. I mean, they make a lot of other accommodations so it seems almost like 
either these people, the immigrants maybe don't know Islam that well, but they're trying to make it an issue, and the Muslim community seems, you know, maybe this is a battle we don't want to take our stand on this hill. So it's front page news now in Wisconsin. It's on things like Fox News, National News, so it, it, it's very prominent. I, I'm, I'm betting probably there'll be something in Time Magazine and stuff like that next week. So this is where you, you know, hear these chants, for, and we were watching a movie in Islamic land, you know, you hear the chant from the minaret, the muezzin is called, he makes the announcement, that's announcing the prayers. It's especially bad if, say, if I'm staying in Jerusalem or someplace, they have to warn you before sunset. That sunset, I mean sunrise, that sunrise is coming and you have to be ready for prayer. So they'll start blaring out the call to prayer. The call to prayer, you know, 20 minutes before sunrise. And then that one ends in prayer is better than sleep. Prayer is better than sleep. And so that's typical of a Muslim country. We kind of have, the only thing we had in the Western world like that was the church bells that announced the hours of prayer. When I was a boy growing up, at 6 o'clock, there was a bell that would ring at the church across, Catholic church across the way. That was saying that now at the monastery, people are praying. There are also seven hours of prayer. We don't do many of them. We do vespers once in a while. We could do the vesper service or matins. And so when the church bell rings, that was to do a time of prayer. Maybe some of you remember this. Did you ever ring the bell at your church during the church service? When was it? Before. During which prayer? The Lord's Prayer. Yeah, why was the church bell rung during the Lord's Prayer? Because most people lived in the village and they kind of lived around the church. You know, maybe they lived out in a farm field somewhere. When the bell rang, the people knew that people at church are praying the Lord's Prayer. And so they could pray the Lord's Prayer with them and join in the prayer. And so there are hours of prayer, but they were flexible. And you have to wash before the prayer. If you're in the desert, you don't have enough water, you can wash with sand. Where did they get that? Judaism, remember, they were criticizing Jesus and the disciples. You're not washing properly. That wasn't hygiene or sanitation or anything like that. Like we would be careful to wash our hands before communion and stuff like that. But it's a ceremonial cleansing. And so it's kind of a recitation of the Quran. And kind of like our services, there can be parts that are the same all the time, and there's parts that differ. It's rather impressive when you see this, because they're all lined up, of course. And they would maybe wouldn't like the term choreographed, but you've probably seen it in videos. It's all choreographed, and the motions are all choreographed. You can't yawn, talk, uh, try to put it delicately. Nothing can come out of either end of your body. <laughs> It, that would make you unclean, and so you have to have this bodily purity. Again, this comes straight from Judaism. Same way. Solidarity of the group, and they face toward Mecca. If you're staying in an Islamic country, you might... Should I just turn this off? Am I loud enough without it? Is that good? Okay, am I talking loud enough? If I'm not talking loud enough at some point, just wave your hand a little bit. So you face Mecca. If you're in an Islamic country, you might say, what's that strange little... They drew an arrow up on the, above the bed and above the room in my hotel. And that tells you which way to face toward Mecca. So there'll be a little arrow pointing which way Mecca. You're in an airport where a lot of Muslim traffic comes through. Probably, I wouldn't doubt if in the chapel at... Uh, Mitchell Field, there's, they've now put in a little arrow to show where Mecca is. Whether you're supposed to use the great circle route or how you use it, I don't know. But you just have to know which way it is toward Mecca. In Islamic buildings, you often see like a little notch in the wall, kind of like the, a little bit like the thing where statues of the saints were. That's, that also indicates which way you are to be facing to pray in order to be facing Mecca in the proper way. And this is the call. Allah Akbar really means Allah U. Allah, Allah is the greatest. So you say that again repeatedly, Allah Akbar, that's what the terrorists also say. You see you have the witness in there that Muhammad is his prophet, and then the call to prayer. Hasten to real success, hasten to real success, and in the morning one it says, prayer is better than sleep, prayer is better than sleep. So when you're seeing a movie and you hear that chant coming out, that's the call to prayer, and it will happen five times in a day. 
The mu'azin is the name of the person that gives the invitation. Prayer is better than sleep. So it kind of gets a little irritating. I mean, in our country, too, some people don't like the church bells ringing. And they complain we don't like the church bells ringing on Sunday morning or something. So that's true. So the hours of prayer, you see, for example, this afternoon, this afternoon one, the nighttime one you can do almost any time at night. So the only ones where really there is an issue is how precise the sunrise and sunset have to be. And that's the conflict here in Milwaukee. As the seasons change, they would have to, technically, if you want to be right on sunset, they'd have to change the break time just about every day, you know, as the sunrise and sunset go. And then maybe some parts of the year, sunset and sunrise wouldn't even be in the prayer time. And so this is the dispute. Now you're saying they pray five times a day? Mm -hmm. and is each, Not all Muslims do, of course. But is each prayer uh, a memorized recitation yeah. of something? Yeah, memorized no, from no the Quran. Petition for anything. You can petition, but that's not part of this. That's separate. So that's why I said the, the translation prayer is somewhat of a, it's not an exact correspondence. It's not, and it's not even like the Lord's Prayer where you ask for things. And it can be longer or shorter depending on what day of the year it is. And it's a little bit, there's some things like the Allah Akbar part, part and that has to be in it all the time. But there's other things that can vary. And who varies that? The, different groups have their, it'd be like our liturgy, maybe the Missouri Senate hymnal isn't quite the same as our hymnal. The washing before it, you have to wash yourself. And again, this is all just ceremonial, very detailed rules. Uh, sex makes you impure for purposes of prayer, and so you have to be purified. That also comes from Old Testament Judaism, doesn't it? Anything that came out of your body, if you were bleeding, bleeding is part of the curse of sin, leads to death. And so anything, infection and stuff on your body. So this too comes out of Judaism, and they have their own version of it. We had a good video of it, but you can find many of them any place on the the uh, internet, and so it's all choreographed. It's kind of impressive, like we have 3,000 people in Jerusalem, and it's just all perfectly choreographed. You know, everybody is doing the same thing. Women can join in the prayers, but basically they're separate from men. They're sometimes in a different area or in the balcony. Again, that's because of ceremonial purity. I think that question came up once before. They would say the women are in the back not because uh, their prayers don't count as much, but you can't have physical contact with people. I'll make you nervous and touch you here. We were in Jerusalem, and Irene, my wife, touched me like that. My wife touching her husband. Uh -huh. And the people came up and really started yelling at us and that. You cannot, a man cannot touch a woman like that publicly, even if they're husband and wife. And so no... No touching allowed. Again, that doesn't mean that all Muslims do it, and they probably knew I wasn't a Muslim, and they were looking you know, for something to make a case of it. And the other reason they say there isn't a delicate way to put it, why do men and women not pray together? Because when you pray, you're looking at the general waist area, the back of the general waist area of the person in front of you. And this is their explanation why men and women cannot pray together. This would be too distracting. <laughs> For, for you to pray together. A, a similar issue will come up in the pilgrimage. So this again, you don't need to know all this, just there's a, it's an opening, it's in some ways like a liturgical service, there's an obligatory prayer, you recite the first ver chapter of the Quran, which is very short, and you're doing standing up, sometimes you're saying, I'm listening to Allah. And so if all those were just symbols of real prayer, there wouldn't be anything bad, would it? We fold our hands, we might bow our head, those mean different things in different countries. Jewish men cover their head when they pray. Christian men don't. So there are things that are just symbols. If they were just symbols, we would say that's fine. If they're just symbols of spiritual things, but they become more than that. Africans are often kind of surprised when they come to our church and we pray. What do you think would shock them about our prayers? We often stand when we pray. In their culture, when you're going to see the king, you can't be higher than the king. You would never stand. I suppose even in, in I don't know how it is in office culture today, but in many cultures, if the boss comes into your office and you're sitting at your desk and he's just not saying hi, you generally stood up and didn't sit down. Maybe if you came into his office, he didn't stand up. 
and often there was a significance, do you have to stand up or if you don't have to? All, the, all these things have symbolic things, but in Islam it's more than symbolic. <laughs> they stress the solidarity of the group, and I said it actually is quite impressive if you see 3,000 people doing this, you know, and they're all uh, together like this, it's almost like a precision dance team. We use the term in English, mosque. Most Muslims aren't offended by mosque, some are, and they say it's derogatory. Their name for the mosque is masjid, quite a ways away from mosque. It simply means the place where you bow down. You, of course, have your rugs, you take off your shoes, and so on. And a masjid can be any place. It can be a formal building. You face toward Mecca. Here, this is in, in Jerusalem at the Temple Mount. There is other prayer, more like our petitionary prayer, or th something that's like the rosary. This is an interesting controversy. Muslims have prayer beads <laughs> where they count off their prayers of remembrance. And what is interesting is that the use of the prayer beads and the rosary in the Roman Catholic Church, and in Islam, the use of the prayer beads, we can trace both of them back. Both of them seem to have begun around the time of the Crusades, which raises the question, did the Muslims get the rosary beads idea from the Catholics, or did the Catholics get the rosary prayer bead idea from the Muslims. So the Muslim rosary beads are a little simpler and a little smaller. So they have something very similar that you can count off your prayers like the rosary, and that's called remembrance. <laughs> okay, anything on their prayer or the social issues it raises? Again, other, most companies like Briggs and Stratton and others they do make accommodations for their prayers, but they generally say, we can give you two breaks, but we can't give you two breaks, and our Christian workers or our non-religious workers don't get any breaks. So they say, we have to, we'll give you two breaks during the workday, and they have to be at a set time. They can't just be whenever you want. It'll be interesting to see now if the, if the Muslims, the workers kind of go back to work then. I think... I think the Islamic community in Milwaukee really wants them to go back to work <coughs> because they're afraid if something is imposed on the Aryans' company that they must give them prayer breaks whenever they want. They're afraid it, employers are going to find every way they can to probably not hire Muslims. I mean, they can't really say, I'm not going to hire you because you're a Muslim. But that employers will be scared off by this and it's going to mess up their assembly line. So this Othman Atta in Milwaukee Journal said, we have to recognize that there are needs of the employers too. So kind of watch that. I would think It'll probably be in the Racine and Kenosha papers to kind of watch it over the next few days and see how this uh, unravels. <clears throat> so any question on that? Okay, then there's the month of Ramadan. I've already told you the month of Ramadan can be any time of the year. Their calendar is actually true a lunar calendar. Our word month means month. But a, a month is actually only about 28 days with some plus or minuses. So if you have 12 cycles of the moon, that will only be 354 days. And what's going to happen, of course, your calendar is going to drift all through the years. About every 33 years, it'll go all the way around. So Ramadan can be any time of year. You can see for a Muslim, that can be a kind of a problem thing if you're in, say, like Alaska or Sweden. Remember, during Ramadan, you can eat during the dark time, but you can't eat during the light time. And if you've got 24 hours of light, you've got a practical problem. And the way they, yeah, yeah, and the way they, it's exactly the same. He said it's like our Easter. That's exactly why our Easter moves, because the Jewish calendar was also a lunar calendar. But the Jews solved the problem in quite a different way. How far can Easter move? About one month. About one month. So what the Jews did, every time the calendar had slid more than a month, they put, they put in a 13th month. So it can slide, and as soon as it slid so, too far, then they'll put in a 13th month to bring it back. So our Easter is based on exactly the same principle, but a different solution. For whatever reason, the Muslims just let it go. So Ramadan can be any time of year. No food or drink or sex or smoking. That's Islamic country. There's usually really a lot of smoking, so that's probably hard too. But you can have complete feast as soon as the sun goes down, and you can feast until just before sunrise comes up. So it's, it's these extremes of the day. If you were in an Islamic country and you were eating on the street or something, it probably wouldn't 
be a good thing. This supposedly is in memory of the giving of the what Quran. Was the last one? Oh. It, it, it says that when he first gave the Quran, they call that the night of power. And so that Ramadan is supposed to be that. But again, their calendar, all of our calendars are artificial. It's kind of interesting. God gave the moon and the sun to, to serve as calendars, didn't he? In Genesis 1. They don't really work exactly because the 12 months don't correspond to one of 12 sober years. And this is purely a Jewish theory, but I think it's kind of interesting. People say, well, why, why would God make a calendar that didn't work? Why don't the sun and moon sync together? And their answer is very logical, but it's not in the Bible. They say when the world and the universe fell into sin, the whole world came under the curse and the damage of sin, doesn't it? And even the sun and moon aren't in harmony with each other anymore. It's kind of an interesting theory. The Bible doesn't say it, but it's kind of an interesting theory. Ramadan, I think it was in the fall. Does anybody remember? It was just, it was just finished a little while ago. Every 33 years it will come around. It's the ninth month of their year, the shifting year. So if it's in June, 33 years from now, it will be back in June. So we'll go around. Why they never changed that, I'm not sure. So feast by day, I mean fast by day, feast by night. Uh, other than Esau, I don't know anybody that was really permanently damaged by not eating food for eight hours. <clears throat> so maybe they exaggerate the, the severity of it a little bit because it, it's every day for one month but then it's a, it's a really time of great feasting. When I was taken to the mosques and that some years ago, generally I was taken, they wanted to, of course, have a good social impression. So I was almost always taken when there was a feast. And usually prominent people in the community sort of uh, support the feast. The feast I was taken to, it was being sponsored by do medical doctors from Pakistan. And they couldn't find a good enough Pakistani caterer in Milwaukee, so they had to import Pakistani caterers from Chicago <laughs> to have the feast. So it was kind of interesting. And the guy that was the host, he had, of course, I'll be glad hanging with everybody, so they put somebody on me to kind of to lead me around. <clears throat> and so I was going through the, through the line, and there's this innocent-looking white stuff. It looks kind of like ranch sauce or something. And I started taking a spoon of it, and my guide said, are you sure? <clears throat> <laughs> I, I said, is it really? He said, it's really, really, really hot. And I said, well, maybe I better just put a little bit on the side. Are you sure? And Pakistani food, if you've had it, real Pakistani food, even the Arabs couldn't eat it. I did a better job of eating it than the Arabs did. But it's a time of great feast, and it's often, there's a certain amount of social prestige. I mean, we have, we have special meals at Christmas and Easter and Thanksgiving. It's sort of similar to that, and often for the community, a prominent person will be paying for it. And that's kind of, kind of an honor to be the one who is supporting the feast. Again, it can be difficult in a non-Muslim society. Can you think of a couple circumstances where it would be quite difficult? You're a Muslim boy who plays basketball on a team that wants to play on the state championship. And your game is going to be at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It could put you in a practical bind. I think most of them would say, well, we'll grant you an exception for this. You can feast later or something. But you can see a number of practical things would come up. And then welcome sunset becomes a time of great celebration. They would say it's for self-discipline. We're not really punishing ourselves for our sins. And yet they say it cleans the slate from sin. And you get complete forgiveness. So I think it very much is a, a work-righteous sort of thing. Just as... Uh, Things like holy water, ashes, and so on can be good symbols of your faith, but if they're used as a means of forgiveness, then they're taking something away from Christ, aren't they? If, if it's, a, it's something that becomes something or you are doing a payment. If you wear ashes on Ash Wednesday as a statement, well, I'm proud to display that I'm a Christian. The point of ashes is to say, I can't earn forgiveness of sins on my own. So we aren't against ceremonies, but these ceremonies support false teaching. You might hear the term id every once in a while. There's a breaking of the fast every day at sunset. And people often will go to the mosque then, even that normally don't. But at the end of the month, that's kind of like Christmas, Easter, New Year's, everything all rolled into one. And this sometimes it's spelled E-I-D in English. And if you'll notice, it, 
for the United States government to keep each issuing Christmas stamps, which probably what's their main motive for issuing Christmas stamps? Yeah, I really sell. They're, re they're really good sellers. And they even have to have one that's religious and one that's not religious to appeal to both sets of customers. So the United States postage stamps that are for Islam are almost always for this. And even when I get mail from the mosque and it would be like five months from this, they would always use this Eid stamp, as it's sometimes called. So the breaking of the fast. This is the... This is one of the USA stamps. 33 cents, so you know this isn't this year. <laughs> <laughs> the first one was when George, the second George Bush was president. And so they will often uh, use this year round. Some Muslims, of course, like we have people that celebrate Christmas. In Japan, they celebrate Christmas, and often it's just kind of a commercial special thing. It's not tied to Christian. Even in Europe, I mean, people maybe still go to hear the Messiah, but it's secular. So I can't imagine anybody in ISIS or anything like that that would send you a Donald Duck card at Ramadan. A secular Indonesian or a secular Egyptian might send you a Donald Duck card or an Aladdin card or something like that. So just as religious holidays are often not... What does holiday mean? Holy day. Holy day. Most of them aren't holy days anymore, are they? It was kind of nice in some ways living in Jerusalem, like on Memorial Day, all the people would actually go to the cemetery. The kids didn't have school off, but they'd go to the cemetery and they'd lay flowers on the graves of soldiers. For most of us, what is Memorial Day? In most cases, there's a little parade, but it's kind of the first cookout holiday of the summer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Even Labor Day, the unions will go out and have a parade, but our, our holidays aren't very much holy days anymore. And there is some loss, something that's lost with that. They have a lot of other calendar holidays too, which we don't, for our purposes, it's not necessary to know them all. Friday is their day of, is, is the, what, what Jews do on Saturday and Christians do on Sunday, they do on Friday. Friday, however, is not a, a day off. You know, you, there's a time off in the afternoon. A lot of the really hot countries, it's kind of siesta time anyway, and you, you go to them. This is actually quite scary for Christians living in Muslim lands because there's a very, very heavy, we'll talk about this next week, there's a very, very heavy correlation between anti-Christian or anti-Jewish violence and the conclusion of the Friday prayers. In other words, if Friday prayers end at three, you're kind of hiding and watching out and just hoping you, you, that 5 o'clock comes around. Because what can happen, say you, you have fired a, a Muslim worker, and he wants to get back to you, and he'll go to the mosque and he'll say, my boss, Mr. So-and-so, desecrated the Quran, and mob will come from the mosque. This is even in a country like Indonesia, which was considered moderate. In Jerusalem, too. If I was leading a tour group there, I probably wouldn't want to be around the <coughs> Temple Mount uh, for, late Friday afternoon. Not that something's going to happen every week, but it just would be the better part of discretion to not be around that Friday afternoon. <clears throat> Why is Jerusalem so important to Muslims? The night of ascension. In the Quran it says, Muhammad had this vision at the farthest mosque where he went up to heaven. He did, it's not an ascension to heaven like Jesus, where he's ascending to heaven and stays there. He's kind of just visiting it and seeing what paradise is like. And it says he did this from the farthest mosque. When the Muslim Empire was in Damascus, Syria, they said that the farthest mosque is the mosque in Jerusalem. And there's a mosque there that's called Al-Aqsa, which means the farthest mosque. There was no mosque there uh, during Muhammad's time, so this could not be true. But that's the Islamic reason for saying Jerusalem is a holy site to us, that there is where Muhammad ascended into heaven. You see his magic horse, got a woman's head, a peacock tail, and so on. And this is his night journey to heaven. <clears throat> Anything on Ramadan? This one, too, doesn't need to, a whole lot of talk or discussion. Zakat means purifying. A Muslim is to give 2.5% <clears throat> of his net worth for the poor and for charity or maybe for Islamic groups. And so what does that mean? If I took it seriously, I have money in my retirement accounts... <clears throat> 
that are not wages I'm getting this year, I should look at the balance of what my retirement accounts are, we'll say December 31st, and I should give 2.5% of my accumulated wealth. But as I pointed out, just like with our IRS, wherever there are tax laws, there will be loopholes and tax lawyers. Sorry if there's any tax lawyers here. That's a good profession. I'll use your help sometime. But that's the very nature of things, isn't it? People will always be looking for the loophole. How can we find a loophole that this income really isn't something we have to pay taxes on? But in principle, you should give 2.5% of your accumulated wealth so that you can keep the other 97.5%. One thing that's controversial is if you give it to, say, ISIS, for example, does that count? Well, our, our government would uh, prosecute you if you did, but it, some, some mosques have given, given to Hamas, which is a, an Islamic fund. I guess you could, I don't think I'm saying it false to call them a terrorist group that operates in Israel and the occupied territories. And they say, well, if we give it to Hamas's food supplies and charitable work, we're not giving it to terrorism. So this is an inter-Islamic issue. It makes pure what you decide to keep. And this takes place at the end of Ramadan. Okay, anything up to there? You know, as you're going through this, in the Bible, there's always areas in the Bible that says that how much God loves us, you know? Does Allah love us? Uh, Not really. They'll, they'll, they'll sometimes use the word Allah is merciful and so on. But if I make a pre presentation of Muslims and they say, you, you're telling me that God is a father who loves me. And they'll say, I never heard that. I don't, think you, I don't think you'd say God is never called loving. He's often called merciful, but that's more the idea I gave you before. He gives you a good rate. He doesn't charge you the full price. But not loving in the sense of our God. He, he, he doesn't have a son, and if he had a son, he wouldn't give him for us. We would have to do it ourselves. The term Hajj, you may want to remember. Again, the Hebrew word for a pilgrim festival is Hag. Same word. Same word that's used to describe. Remember, the Jews were supposed to go up to Jerusalem at the Passover, Tabernacles, and so on. And so that's this pilgrim festival. As the Islam world got bigger and bigger, of course, this was often a once-in-a-lifetime thing. In the Middle Ages, it could take somebody three months of traveling. Maybe you... Uh, set aside a year of your life to travel and stop at different Islamic schools and reach Mecca. You can go on a pilgrimage to Mecca any time during the year, but it's special credit at, the, at this time. And you should do that once in your life. If a Muslim has his name is Haji, I'll date myself again many years, I think it's, I'm, I'm guessing it might be 30 years ago, there was a kicker for the New York Giants, and his name was Haji Sheikh. Well, what he was claiming is that either that he went on a Hajj or maybe it had become a family name. Grandpa went on the Hajj or something. By calling himself Haji Sheik, he's saying, I come from a noble family that has made the Hajj. So you're only obligated to do this once in your lifetime. And it's a very complicated thing. And again, the details aren't important for us. You go to Mecca, it takes days. You're doing laps around this Kaaba at the great mosque there. Millions of people are there in tent cities. Almost every year you hear of a a stampede of some sort. They're trying to move these millions of people. And this, this reflects badly on the Saudi government. And, you know, sometimes there's like two or three hundred people killed in a stampede someplace Is there. Is there something inside that black thing? There? You are not allowed to go in. There's a, there's a sacred stone which you can see. It's pretty clear that this was the shrine, the heathen shrine that was in Mecca when Muhammad came. Huh. It's not something you go into. So the road to Mecca or Mecca, again, you have different different names for it. It's a big, big thing for the Saudi government. <clears throat> the reward of Hajj was acceptable by Allah. The Most High is nothing but paradise. You see, again, this is quoting an authoritative tradition. So again, it's a good work of merit. So it's during the 12th month, 2 million pilgrims, sometimes even more than that. But you can make a little Hajj anytime. You don't have to go at the month when the big one is. But it's not as much credit. Again, pilgrimage was often part of Christian religion. If you go to the shrine of St. James, you'll get healing. Or the different shrines of Mary, you try to go to Lourdes, and then maybe you go to Guadalupe, and you go to these different shrines. There it's more for healing, but it's also a credit. 
And very often at these shrines, there also are sacred waters in which you can bathe. This is also true in Eastern Orthodoxy, or that there's the icon of Mary. You can get a little icon of Mary, and you can take it home with you, and that is some good, but to get the most credit, you have to be at the real, you have to visit to the real icon. And so the same kind of thing. So people will come from throughout the Islamic world. I think now they kind of have quotas. And here again, where you can see where it's tricky, they can't keep the Shiites out. And so Iran, anytime hap something happens and Iranians are killed by accident, they will really come down on the Saudi government because they're bitter enemies. And so Shiites and them together. People live in vast tent cities, which again are administered by the Saudi government. It reminds you of something. Jesus and the disciples had a camp out in Gethsemane. So this is very much like Judaism. So when they go to this thing, this hug or whatever, um, Shiites and, uh, and, and Sunnis all mixed together? Yeah, because they can't keep the crowd control. We'll, we'll see a little bit about it. Attention yeah. them when they're I think they're usually they're concerned with paying attention to their, to their own Hajj. Yeah. See the big tent cities, the freeways become closed so they can become pedestrian ways. You can see how when you go through a tunnel, you take like now this new tunnel we have in Milwaukee just north of the airport. If you got two million people moving down the freeway and they come through a tunnel like that, that's often where these uh, death tragedies happen. You wear special attire. The theory of course is all Muslims are equal, that's far from true of course. So everybody is supposed to wear the same thing. This is the required attire. Women can go. It's interesting, even in Muslim countries where women are required to cover their face, on the Hajj, you cannot cover your face. Women are to wear, I, I took this right from their site, I think they mean costume, their Islamic custom, wearing neither face cover nor gloves. <clears throat> However, a woman may cover her face with a slight veil only if her beauty is tempting enough to cause seduction. <laughs> To me, that's, that's like a keg of dynamite. <laughs> Can you put yourself in the position, you're this poor Muslim husband, yeah, and she says, she says, honey, do you think I need to wear, <laughs> do you think I need to wear a mask to Mecca? That is one of those questions, like, does this make me look fat or something like that? Well, you better find a way to change the subject <laughs> because there's probably not a really good answer. This, again, is from tradition. This is not from the Quran. But notice this next part is important. We're going to talk about the role of women later. A woman should let her voice be audible only to herself. She can't talk out loud. In other words, it's an Islamic practice, I won't call it a principle, that it is the woman's responsibility to not, anytime there's out of line sex or something, it's the woman's responsibility because she is the one who has created the temptation. It is not the man's responsibility to avoid temptation. But that's another subject for another day. But even here you see the responsibility rests with the woman, not with the man. She, even if she's just out in public <clears throat> without her husband, <clears throat> that's her fault. But that's probably not next week, the week after next. <clears throat> The great mosque, again, they really want it to go well because it's their prestige. The center of the Islamic world. You kind of do laps around this great Kaaba. It's, they, I mean, it must be a nightmare of crowd control, you know, to get everybody through all the right steps in a few days. You kiss the black stone. If that isn't superstition, I don't know what it is. Anybody you see not in white, who is that guy helping, helpfully having an umbrella for himself? Those are the Saudi security people. So everybody, I rule, is supposed to be in the same white. The security people, just like you go to a concert here, the security people usually have something that, that marks them as security people. So all the guys here in these greenish yellow coats, they are the security guys. <clears throat> you go to the well of Zamzam, which supposedly was where Hagar was, remember Hagar and Ishmael, and you do the proper washings. You camp out at a city named Mina. You spend the night there. Again, the details aren't important for us. You visit the Mount of Mercy. I don't know if the terrorist Arafat was named after this or not. You stone Satan. That pillar represents Satan. They must have somebody go in there and scoop out the stones. And so you go by and you throw stones at Satan. Mm. Is part of it into this uh, thing here. So their Satan is our Satan. Uh, he's called no. It's, he's called Iblis in. Arabic, but it's the same, same idea of Satan. He's a fallen angel. The, he, Satan is the Hebrew word. 
the sacrifices are, are not like sacrifices for sin, like the Old Testament. They're really part of the feast. They're special sacrifices. I don't know that you can see it quite in the light here, but there, I put this one in because there are like lap lines there, like on a track. And so that's one way they kind of do things. You know, stay in your lane. Do not cross the yellow line or the solid white line or whatever the case may be. They cut up the cover every year, and if you get a little swatch, then a new cover is made. You can go to Medina, which is where the prophet is buried. Just a ways down the road at the mosque of the prophet. And again, this is a great importance to the Saudi government. It's the center of their prestige. They would say we really don't have clergy, but I, I would say they do, especially the Shiites, the Ayatollahs. No alcohol, no pork products. This next one, you see the, the Saudi guys, you see them with falcons all the time. They're not supposed to have birds of prey. A lot of them go to Monte Carlo, you know, the Saudi royal family and so on. Pork products. Where are you going to get in trouble if you're McDonald's? If you have you not even in the sausage, if you have used pork fat in making the French fries, or there was a big mutiny in India. In the old days of the old rifles, you had to kind of bite, bite the cartridges. And the Muslims who were trying to stir up revolt against the British, they had enough reason to do that, but they said, well, they, that they had put pork fat on there. So any contact with pigs. Our famous General Pershing, I'm not commending him, <clears throat> Blackjack Pershing, he was one of the heroes of World War I. The Muslim islands in the <clears throat> Philippines <clears throat> were rebelling against the United States colonization. <clears throat> and Pershing had the job <clears throat> of suppressing the terrorism. What he did is he said, and he hadn't gotten the memo at political correctness, and again, I'm not endorsing it, but apparently it was somewhat effective. <laughs> and so there's this, this contact, any contact with pork, and especially if you're buried with pork, you didn't want that. As I said, uh, Pershing didn't get the memo about being sensitive, that's for sure. Again, you're not supposed to charge interest, but there's always ways around that. <clears throat> <laughs> Emphasis on the family, the brotherhood of all people, but they are as racist as any other people in the world. Islamic law, only about 10% is directly from the Quran. Most of it is tradition. Hmm. Just like among the Jews, there's different schools of rabbis. There were different orders in the Catholic Church. The Jesuits and the Dominicans often didn't agree with each other. They had different views. They had rather bitter opposition. There are these different schools. So again, if you're Muslim, you try to decide, well, can I get a liberal? It'd be like a Christian saying, well, I want to go to the most liberal church that will kind of allow me to, to do everything. <laughs> or that, that's the way it is in the religious world. People shop. For the, these aren't exactly denominations, but for the denomination that will conform to what their beliefs are. Again, some stuff you absolutely cannot do. It's a little bit like the concept of Adiaphora. We would say it's true that in the Bible, God says, here's a bunch of stuff you must do. Over, he says a bunch of stuff you must not do. And there's a whole bunch of stuff. He hasn't said you can drink beer or you can't drink beer. <clears throat> He's left it up to us in the middle. Again, they are zealous and say they have submitted to God, but they really have not. <clears throat> I'll take, I think I'll take five minutes of questions. If you need to excuse yourself, you can. I have to get back over for the second service. Next week, this is kind of the religious part, which for us is the most important part. How do we reach them with the gospel? We'll have an evangelism section way at the end. But next week, I'll start talking about the problems like terrorism, war in Islam. We probably won't get to the role of men and women in Islam next week yet, but the week after that. So the next two weeks will be more on, I guess you could call the, we're, we've talked about the spiritual threat of Islam or the spiritual danger of Islam. And the next two parts will be more about the the political and the worldly threat, the history of this in the world. It's nothing new, of course. It's been going on since the 700s. I'll take one or two questions. <clears throat> Anybody have any? I would say that if it wasn't for the shore, we would have never heard of Israel. Is what? We would have never heard of Israel if it wasn't spread by the sword from the beginning. Well, he said it was spread by the sword from the beginning. It was, as you'll see. It, all the... All the spread of Islam from Spain to India was all by war. Not that people didn't later voluntarily become Muslims because they wanted to be in good with the government. But 
Indonesia it kind of spread by commerce. Every place else it spread by war. One last. <laughs> Just a comment on when you showed the picture of those in Jerusalem where they were praying at the Temple Mount. It was noted to us when we were there that when they do that, they're completely exploding the backside toward the Temple Mount. Toward the toward the to, to face Mecca, they have to turn their back to the other. But they also have another mosque on the south end. And the one with the silver dome, if you've been there. So they say, well, we're facing the one with the silver dome. Yeah, it's kind of like a thunder. Yeah, yeah. They have to have their back toward the Dome of the Rock, which is the great architectural feature there. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us salvation as a gift. In love, we give our offerings and our service to you, not to earn your favor and forgiveness, but in thanks that you have given us salvation by grace as a free gift. Help us also share this great truth with others, especially those who are in the darkness of trying to save themselves by their own works. Help us have love and zeal to preach the gospel to them, even to those who do not want it but need it. Amen.